Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session of um, the 15 Safety Gala Virtual Workshop. And my name is Ehi Eden. I'm the president of OSH Africa. I'll be moderating this very session. And uh, we are looking at uh, rethinking safety, reassessing and redesigning and reshaping the place of work. We are all aware of the challenges that have been placed on the workplace as a result of COVID-19 and would have, which has shifted the lines and, and, and the, the risk patterns as it relates to uh, employees and employers alike. What we're looking at today is how do we assess possible risk in the workplace? What are the challenges? And what could be the possible solutions that are available in dealing with these uh, uh, challenges? How do we improve safety culture? How do we, how do we ensure that risks to employees are duly mitigated? How do we return employees back to their families at the end of the day, unhurt, unharmed, or not even killed? It is the right, as you, as you know, with the, with the right of employees to work, it is the right of every employee to go to workplace and come back without any form of harm. How do we, in, on our own, look at our work, workplaces, ensuring that those challenges that are valuable are, are clearly dealt with, commitment from leadership, and seeing how we can use possible um, uh, Vision Zero Golden rules, I mean, to see how we can mitigate this. With me in this session today, we have uh, uh, my very good brother and friend, uh, that'll be and it's, um, Mr. Matthew Nkube from South Africa. And uh, we also have a very wonderful colleague, Lero Nasserero from, from Botswana. These are two wonderful Osh African um, experts uh, who we have worked with for, for a number of years and they are trusted and they've been tested, committed to improving workplace uh, safety standards. So we welcome you, we welcome you uh, both to this uh, session. Can you hear me? Can you both hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I can hear great, you. Great. I just, thank you so much. Welcome to this very great session, and uh, I'm happy that we are, we are all here eventually. Uh, Larona, I will be um, taking on you first and saying. Um, what you have uh, to present to us. Lerona is a very versatile occupational health and safety consultant who works in um, Boto University, uh, Botswana, and she's a lecturer and a very excellent professional of repute. Lerona, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ehi. Uh, thank you to OSH Africa for giving me this opportunity. Um, are we able to see my presentation? Sure, we can see it. Thank you so much, sir. Now, uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, my presentation today is on leadership commitment towards managing workplace occupational health and safety challenges. And my name is Larona Serrero. Now, um, my presentation is going to cover safety challenges. We will also look at leadership role in occupational health and safety, benefits of a committed leadership, and then finally, we will have a conclusion. Now, it is important to understand that leadership in organizations they play an important role in ensuring health and safety of organizations. Leadership, we are talking about leadership at all levels. Um, we're not just talking about line, line managers. Um, we're talking about all leaders, whether top management or line managers. Um, it is important that they all uh, should be seen to be contributing to occupational health and safety because at the end of the day, what they do is going to reflect um, on the organization. The organization is going to follow their lead. Now, when we talk about um, leadership, 
the Institute of Industrial Safety Culture, they define safety leadership as the capacity to mobilize people around safety challenges and influence behavior so that it becomes safer. So as we have already mentioned, it's important that, you know, uh, they lead by example because uh, whatever it is that they do as leadership, it is going to be cascaded down. You know, people who are down in the hierarchy are going to mimic or they are going to emulate what leadership is doing. Now, there have been many studies that have been done and many of these studies, they show that indeed leadership does play an important role in ensuring um, safety within workplaces. What leadership does will ultimately have an impact on the safety, on how the organization perceives safety. Um, the interaction between leaders and employees shape employee actions as well as perceptions towards workplace safety. Now, it is very important for leaders to lead by example. It is important for leaders to be seen, uh, to be um, endorsing occupational health and safety uh, because um, as strong and effective as well as a visible leadership in terms of health and safety will help to overcome challenges, workplace challenges, workplace occupational health and safety challenges. Challenges such as incident rates, high incident rates or accident rates. So if leaders are not concerned about occupational health and safety, it will ultimately lead to incident rates and accident rates skyrocketing. Um, if they are doing, you know, um, they're putting action into health and safety, it will ultimately lead to a reduction in incident rate and accident rates because employees will be, um, they will put into action uh, what leadership uh, requires them to do. So the environment also, um, it will be such that um, all the hazardous, all the hazards within the environment will be controlled and hence as such that will lead to a reduction in incident rates. And then most of the time you'll find that there is nobody who wants to go to the workplace and not return, you know, healthy and safe. So if leadership are seen to be, um, to be pro-occupational health and safety, to be investing in occupational health and safety, this can lead to a reduction in employee turnover. Otherwise, you know, employees would come and go because they do not, uh, they will not trust, for example, that, you know, they can return back to their families healthy, um, as well as safe. So it is important in order to prevent this high employee turnover for leadership to be giving health and safety a priority. Now, another reason is that, you know, with proper health and safety within workplaces, we can have a reduction in loss of resources. I know I've already mentioned one of the resources, the resources, which is employees, and then other resources would also include money and time. For example, if we have accidents within workplaces, then it means that you can have, you know, loss, loss as a result of that accident, uh, loss in terms of, you know, your equipment will be damaged um, and it will require money in order to, in order to bring back the, the, the production back to where it was. And also it will require time. You know, during an accident, 
there is downtime while you are attending to the accident. And obviously that will affect production. Um, legal compliance. Now, it's important that leadership should be seen to be committed to health and safety. And one of the indicators would be legal compliance. We all know in our different countries that there is legislation that governs occupational health and safety. And, you know, um, if we do not abide by the legislative requirements, there can be punitive measures that are associated with lack of compliance. You know, punitive measures um, according to the legislative instruments that we have. So in order to avoid that, it is important that uh, leadership should invest in occupational health and safety. Um, uh, company image is also dependent on what goes on within an organization. For example, if you are always having incidents, you are always having accidents, you are polluting the environment, then you know your organization would have a bad reputation. It will be known as that organization that does not care about its employees, that organization that does not care about the environment. So um, if leaders are committed to ensuring you know, um, safe, safety within the workplace, all these challenges would be addressed. Now, it is important to understand that leadership are there in order to ensure that the duty of care, the duty by the employer is realized. So um, leadership, when they ensure safety within the workplace, then uh, we, they will ensure that their actions will ensure that you know there is legal compliance. There is also the obligation or the social obligation, the obligation towards um, communities is also realized, and also the financial obligation towards the organization uh, is also realized. For example, if there is an accident, then. Um, there's going to be loss of money, loss of money uh, when you are compensating people, loss of money when you are not producing because now you are attending to the, to the accident, loss of money um, in terms of replacing anything that has been damaged as a result of the accident. So when leaders are, are committed, towards ensuring health and safety. All these or losses that are associated with all these can then be um, avoided. Now, there are various ways in which leadership can show commitment to occupational health and safety. So we want to see leaders who are strong, leaders who are active, in terms of occupational health and safety. We want to see leaders who participate in um, initiatives that have been, you know, that are within the workplace that promote health and safety. We want to see um, leadership endorsing and participating in safety programs within the workplace. We want to see them, you know, uh, making it possible for meetings, you know, being involved during audits. This is so important because um, the employees are looking at them. And when they see leadership being part, participating, you know, endorsing programs that we have within the workplace, then, you know, they will follow suit. They will also participate and they will realize the importance of, you know, commitment towards occupational health and safety. Now, uh, it is also important for organizations to have policies, policies that are you know, specific to the type of hazards that you have within the workplace. And let's see these policies not just being on paper, 
but the policies should be implemented and regularly reviewed, you know, as the organization um, grows with time, you know, the policy should also match that. Uh, let's ensure as leaders that there are policies, policies endorsed by us, you know, policies that have objectives, objectives that are meant to create safe conditions within the workplace. And let's ensure that, you know, these policies are implemented and they are available to all interested and affected parties. And then it is also important to ensure that, you know, as leadership, we integrate safety and health in all organizational decisions, okay? Let's not, safety should not come second. It should be part of all decisions that are made. Let's make sure that, you know, uh, uh, because if you understand the importance of safety, you will see that if you do not, um, integrate safety into your decisions, if you don't take safety uh, seriously, then in the long term, even the short term, it can have consequences, consequences which will um, affect, you know, your organization, which will also affect, you know, resources within your organization. So as, 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 as leaders, let's make sure that Every decision that is taken within the workplace, it is taken with safety in mind. Um, now, it is also important that we ensure conditions are, you know, suitable such that, you know, all workplace um, hazards can be identified and controlled. Okay, let's not make it difficult for workplace hazards to be identified. Let's put measures in place as leadership to ensure that, you know, the workplace is sa as safe as possible. Let's be seen to be playing an active role. I know sometimes management or leaders would say we are not um, safety professionals. And that is true. That is why, you know, there are, there is training that management can undergo. So as organizations, if we feel that our managers uh, need to be taught or need more information with regards to health and safety, need to understand what health and safety is, you know, let's make sure that we allocate resources towards ensuring that management undergo training such that they appreciate safety. They would know the importance of, you know, um, making decisions with safety in mind at all times. And then also it is important that we, uh, as organizations, let's have people who are competent to give us advice in terms of health and safety within the workplace. Let's allocate resources which will ensure that, you know, people who are properly trained uh, to be there to create safe conditions within the workplace are there. It is not, you know, um, I know, Sometimes you'd find that when we visit workplaces, you'd find that there would be someone who's not trained because they've been injured or there have been um, some issues or management somehow is trying to reward them for whatever reason. They decide to make them a safety officer or a safety manager, even though they don't have the competent skills. So it is important to ensure that the people who are responsible for safety are the ones with the right skills. And then um, it is also important that uh, let's make communication, um, let's make sure that there is easy communication, whether it's between levels or within levels. You know, flow of information, communication will ensure that you know, there is, um, you, you are able to create safety within the workplace. Uh, let's make sure that we allocate resources towards health and safety. Resources do not, does not necessarily mean monetary resources. 
Uh, it can also mean time. It can also mean, you know, facilities. Okay, let's make sure that we do not um, discourage people who are motivated towards creating a safe and healthy working environment by, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, not giving them the resources that they need. I know management is the one that can allocate these resources. So as management, we urge you to ensure that all the resources that are necessary to ensure safety within the workplace are available. Now, uh, the benefits that you can realize from being a committed leadership is that, for example, there will be a reduction in injury rates, there will be a reduction in you know, the amount of time that your employees spend away from the workplace. When they are away from the workplace, it means that that can have an effect on production. So it's important that we create a safe working environment such that you know, the employees can be able to give their all towards production. And then um, with regards to the organization, organizations can reap benefits from commitment of leadership. For example, you know, an organization can ensure compliance to legal and even other requirements. Say, for example, if you want to be certified, then, you know, certifications, sometimes the uh, competent authorities who you need certifications from, they will require that you should be, you know, comply with, you should have some level of safety within your, your workplace. So when you are committed, this can be um, guaranteed. And then also uh, you can have that strong, positive safety culture within the organization. A strong and positive safety culture within organizations has its own benefits also, okay, associated with it. And then as an organization also, uh, there can be reduced employee turnover. Nobody wants to work for an organization that does not care about their health and safety, okay? We are all working such that we can create um, or we can be able to, to take care of our families. And nobody wants to leave you know, their home to go to work and not be able to return, okay? So you can be known as that organization that does everything in its power to ensure that employees are safe. And as a result, competent employees will stay within your organization. You won't have a, you won't have a situation whereby you know, people would be leaving. You will be constantly recruiting people to come to your organization. And then improved productivity as well as quality, reduced compensations, improved image as well as investor confidence. So all these are basically benefits. If we have a strong and committed leadership, you can reap a lot of benefits from that. Um, in conclusion, I want to say that I know in a lot of organizations in Africa, especially, you know, safety is still it's it is still in its infancy. And um, I want to say that, you know, it is important to invest in safety. Leadership, it is important to invest in safety. Let's you know, ensure that our organizations are safe. And when organizations are safe, we will be able to reap benefits both on a short term as well as on a long term. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ilerona. This was succinctly put together points were coming out in slow but very consistent doses. Everything you said, we heard you, we heard you loud and clear. And um, thank you so much um, for a very great presentation. We will we, we move to the next speaker right now, but you stay back in case there are questions after the next speaker. Thank you so much, we really appreciate it. That was very clear and the points were very um, were well noted and uh, 
Thanks so much. Very good work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you heard you heard Lerona uh, where she was dropping those points. Um, they were very consistent, and she was very emphatic as they come. And I'm happy that we've learned so much about uh, health and safety in workplace and all the items she lifted, listed like on leadership commitment and the benefits to all and sundry. That was very good. So we'll move to the next speaker right now. Matthew Unkube is a very highly sought after speaker uh, in, within Africa. He has done so much work uh, within the region. I mean, uh, working for uh, working on ILO programs across different countries. And we were looking for who would speak on this topic. I realized there was no better person that we could approach than Matthew Kobe. Matthew Kobe is originally a Zimbabwean, but he resides and works in South Africa. Matthew Kobe, thank you for honoring this invitation, and the floor is yours now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I'd like to just acknowledge you, my brother. And I think, you know, you're more than a brother. Uh, we are bonded together by the mission that we're trying to achieve for Africa and all the colleagues. <clears throat> I actually wondered when I, when I, uh, the president spoke to me, he said to me, and he was very casual, he said to me, please, I'd like you to deal with this topic. Then I readily accepted. Then I start researching and what have you. This is what we have, uh, which I thought we, we can do and look at now. Uh, in terms of my presentation. I don't know what's going on now. Uh, I can't move my... I want to move my slides. Um, I want to move my slides. I don't know what's going on now. Is yeah. it frozen? Okay. No, no, it's fine now. The, first of all, okay. as I said, we are, why are we here? We are advancing the agenda of Osh Africa. Africa is such a precious uh, region, and we really have a lot of things that Sorry, we, Matthew, we need to be thinking. Matthew, we are not seeing your slide. Pardon? We are not you seeing see your slide. slide. No. OK, let me, let me go back again. Yeah, what you do, uh, take it, you take it and upload it again, yeah. Let me take it out and then start again. Yes, yes, yes. And share again, yeah. All right, let me go to sharing. Can you see me? We cannot see it. All right, let me go on. Let me just start again. Yes, yeah, start again. Can you see the screen now? I think it's coming up, gradually. it's loading now. Then, yeah, we are seeing your, we are seeing your system now. Then share your slide. Yes, it's coming up right now. Then put Thank it on, you. put it on slideshow. Okay. Put it on slideshow now. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay, can you see it now? Excellent, you can go ahead now. Thank you so much. Right. Sorry about that. I was saying, uh, <clears throat> why are we here? We are advancing the agenda of Osh Africa because Africa needs what we're doing right now. If anything, we should have done this many years ago, but we haven't lost time. We still can move very fast. What am I going to talk about today? I'll give you some introduction and give you a bit of the background is why this topic is so important, why uh, <clears throat> we need to raise and motivate for businesses to understand what exactly is the cost of not implementing uh, occupational safety and health programs in the workplace properly. And why is it so critical? So they understand in terms of both quantum, in terms of both financial, what it means for Africa. I'll talk about the provisions of the presentation. Then I'll also talk about this particular area where I'll cover the failures of the management systems. As the previous speaker alluded, I won't spend much time on this, but I'll just go through the typical ones that 
prevail right now. The reason why I'm sharing this with you is because I've spent over 40 years in the workplace and in this field. And this, this journey has been very interesting. I've seen what's been happening, both as my, my brother said, from ILO perspective, from World Bank perspective, as well as as, as a national executive leader, you know, in charge of the a country's occupational safety and health uh, program for the whole country. And I've looked at this from various angles. I've worked in the corporate organizations as well. And that what I'm sharing with you is what I've gathered in all these journeys. I'm still involved right now in the field. What is, I also talk about the prevailing status quo of the OHS trend. What's going on really? Why are we where we are? And also give you, let now talk about what, why we're here. The cost of us into business. I want us to just you know, paint a picture, which really is much more than what is already been spoke, spoken uh, by my previous speaker. Also, I also want to talk about sources of information in depth. This is very critical because when you come to it, you understand why we're failing at times to actually assess and quantify what exactly is the impact of occupational health so in terms of valuable and valid data and information. And also the immediate edge of H is that we need to look at as Africa and then also the way forward. That's what I'll talk about. Let's go on. There you are. That is what we have in workplaces. They don't have gone to the extreme, literally, but that's, that's not an extreme. It's common in various countries, as I'll share with you later on, when I talk about the, some of the statistics, some of the disasters that have happened. I thought, you know, when, when I look at this picture, I look at the worst scenarios that have happened. So you know, we start from there. And also this talks to the issue of high risks that actually are allowed to occur in workplaces due to the failures of the management system. Larona has talked about those as well. Why, why am I talking about this? Uh, why I'm talking about this is because I want us to discuss the adverse impact of improper management of occupation safety and health for, on business. That's the main, main, main agenda why I'm here. And also, I want to talk about, to highlight the requirements for proper collection, collection uh, of analytical data and information on the performance of the OSH management system. I also want to demonstrate the strategic importance of quantitative and qualitative performance of OSH management. In other words, though these two parameters are very critical in understanding and diagnosing exactly what is the impact of, of not managing occupational safety in, 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 for business. And I also want to justify the critical need for businesses to make a significant contribution of resources for effective occupational safety and health management systems. Resources, they cover a plethora of requirements and elements. That's one thing that we need to look at. Larona spoke about some of them. They include things like time, financial, infrastructure, equipment, machinery, various other commitments that need to be put in place to make sure that you know, things actually work in place. The reason why we have this problem here is about it's around the culture. I'll talk about the culture later on as well. What is the impact? This can give you an overview. What's the impact on business of not managing occupational safety and health properly? We need to look at a number of issues. The people. People, they get injured. People, they've got illnesses. They've got disease. But there are other issues that we're not actually highlighting here. Things like, you no know, mental stress, mental health conditions that arise. When people have lost a loved one, that remains, that remains as a latent and progressive effect on them. It doesn't go away. No matter, no, no matter the amount of uh, compensation that people can be given, there's also an issue of property, technology, equipment, damage and loss. There's also the issue of the processes themselves, productivity, materials and quality. Because the reason why we look at businesses are there also as part of contributing to economic development. They employ people, but it's not, it's about how we employ people. Also, there's also the environmental issues here, the, the pollution of the air, the land, the water, and our ecology. So when we quantify and qualify the impact of business, we need to look at all these parameters together. But the way we are looking at things right now is rather skewed 
we tend to look at more uh, only traumatic things that we see very clearly, which are also not even reported properly. That's one thing that we know. There's other reporting, there are certain behaviors which don't encourage people to be transparent and obvious about uh, reporting the effects of, of uh, failures in the workplace. I think that in some, in some countries, in some sectors, they've got this bonus scheme, which allows people to overexert themselves beyond what normally should be tolerated. But how do we address those issues? So this is what we, we, is, 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 is a big challenge for us. So looking at the failures, what are they? Just want to highlight them for you. We fail to prevent repeats. You investigate, you don't implement the remedial elections that come from there. We fail to identify the root causes, which is where the, the, the big issue. We fail to apply the lessons that we've learned from previous failures, failures. We even fail to identify the failures in the whole shape of occupational safety and health management system. We fail to do that. And also we fail to implement effective and efficient corrective measures. We know we've been told about this and people start telling, oh no, we don't need the money. We don't need what have you. I'll share with you some of the experiences of how I dealt with these issues and what we need to look at in terms of going forward. Also, we fail to identify opportunities for organization improvement. Now, what needs to be done where there's this whole introspection, business step back and say, okay, what should we do to improve what we're doing? In most organizations, you find that people continue on the trajectory of failure and they go on and go on without checking themselves because they're used to doing things the way they do them. There's a saying that if you continue doing what you've always done, you'll get nothing. That's exactly where we are. We have that as a trend. Also, we fail to identify risks that we missed in our risk management. Some organizations, they implement risk, risk management systems, but some of it, when you look at it, it's not even done properly. Because people, as I want to say, they're not trained properly. That is a dichotomy for us, colleagues, as professionals, because we as shared professionals, we're supposed to provide leadership for how occupational safety and health should be managed. But the question is, we as professionals, what are we saying? Are we applying ourselves ethically and morally? Well, that, that thing comes in, it comes in as an issue. Also, we failed to implement the resilient improvements in our processes. We also failed to implement improvements in our technology. We also failed to improve improvements in our, uh, I've been repeated processes twice there. Also, we failed to identify the risk, as I said, in the whole organization in terms of that risk profiling. We fail to identify what it started, improving people's knowledge. This has come in as a very big issue right now. I'll talk to you later on about when I talk about interventions, the focus that we need to look at. We fail to identify weaknesses in the whole organizational system. Okay? We fail to identify opportunities for improving people's skills. There's knowledge, there are people's skills. It's two different things. We fail to identify opportunities for achieving excellence we fail to entrench an enterprise risk-based culture. This is the cost of the measure. The reason why you find that you no know, people get injured, we have accidents, is this is actually the biggest issue that we have because we don't have this perception whereby people, employees and even management, they assess and say, okay, what I'm looking at, what I'm dealing with, is there a risk? And you know about the principle of risk management. That perception needs to be raised away by its own, by every employee in the whole organization. That is one of the key issues that we talk about. The other day, Tutula was talking about social dialogue, the role of the empowerment of employees, the empowerment of workers, the entrenchment of the right to refuse or remove themselves on the grounds of safety. How is that achieved? It's achieved by making sure that you know, employees are aware, they understand. They've got the ability and capacity to identify the risks. Okay, let's go on. Some of the issues that I, I highlighted as significant factors for this occupation safety and management system. Information management. Some cases we don't even have the right information to help us make the right decisions. You know, you can't develop a strategy, you can't develop a management system for OSH without the right information. In other words, the information tells us what are the challenges, what are our needs in terms of both qualification and qualification. 
and where I think is happening. The organization framework, the organization and framework. When I talk about these two, there's organization arrangement to achieve excellence, to protect and make sure that the workplace is provides for health and safety. The, the framework, how, what happens? In the, you, I, I like what Laron has mentioned as well. One of the things that I picked up when I got in the industry, as I know, when somebody fails in other department, either production or engineer or whatever, they relegate them. And where do they relegate them to? Safety department. I st when I, I was a, an executive, I refused. I told the organizers, the, the leader said, guys, this is not a casualty department. This is not a rehabilitation department. This is a department where I need able-bodied people that are physically and physiologically fit perform their work. So don't give me people that have got one foot in the wrong side and what have you to come to my department. No, this is not a retirement department. This is an active department. So it's so some of the culture that we have. Also, the configuration. When I talk about configuration, it's about how we structure our programs. This is one of the key, key areas that is a very key, very important because in some cases I asked I have a challenge people say, okay, do you know this thing called occupational safety and health? Do you know what it means? Nowadays it's got shared and she and quality. And you know some of the, the, the challenges that we have. And I'm glad Ost Africa, as Ost Africa, we are addressing this issue of professionalism. We are saying we need to define this element that's called occupational safety, which deals with the, the physical workplace, infrastructure, the planning, the whole place. Then occupational health, which is when you bring people to the workplace, what happens? How do you address the issues, the requirements for people? Okay. Then you've got the environment where people work. There's environment in the workplace. There's environment in the community where people come from. Then quality has come in. But you know what uh, has happened in most organizations? There's been this migration where people, because these things became fashionable at the time. They were factory inspectors. Uh, you know, they did what they did. Then when safety became fashionable, like the jeans. Then they say, ah, became the safety officers. Then the health became, then they became safety and health officers. Then the environment came and then they became she officers. Then quality came, then became shake officers. Yet this individual, this individual has got no iota of knowledge of what occupational safety and health is. Colleagues, sorry, I'm lamenting this because it's one of the plethora that is facing Africa. And unfortunately, what has happened President, I'm appealing you to you. We have a challenge. Because all of a sudden, even uh, tertiary institutions, universities, whatever, they really realize that no, there's money to be made in occupational safety and health. And what if every institution is working up and offering services, I mean, training in, or professional education, occupational safety and health? They're going to get somebody who's got arts to go and do occupational safety and health. I wonder, you know what I'm talking about. This, that's the reality of Africa. Somebody who's got a geography. He says, all of a sudden, he wakes up tomorrow, he's done a geography a qualification. Now, all of a sudden, they are occupational safety and health professionals. And I said to myself, what are we doing here? So are we configured to get things right? Then the effective structures, the perception of the value of occupational safety and health. Laron, you touched on that. It is an integral requirement for every industry, for every workplace. Is it actually mainstream in the appraisals? performance of the leader of the organization. Where I worked, even I worked with the last of Anglo and all these other institutions, I made sure that at least 30% of the appraiser was due to occupational safety and health performance. That made it significant because if you know that, no, you're gonna lose 30% of your bonus, you do something about it. But if uh, you make it 5%, oh, the guys will tell you, no, I can do away with 5%, I'll get my bonus 95%. So that's the culture. The risk making processes was an issue. The legal compliance, Larona, I'm glad you mentioned it, but you know, again, colleagues, I want to share with you quickly. The laws by design, most of our laws by design, they take about three years from the brown paper to yellow paper, whatever. And by the time they come out of the oven, they are already three years out of date, you understand, with what's happening in the workplace. So, what is our attitude? What should be our, our approach? The law provides for minimum requirements. We can always do better. Now, they refer to what is the current development, what's going on in the workplace, the technology, and all these issues. Then the orchard management system approach. 
you talked about the policy. Policy is fine, but policy is the framework. Do people understand why the policy is so important and what it takes to develop a policy? Then the programs. You can have a policy, but you got implemented through program, things being done. Okay. So what is the status quo? This is status quo. On the right hand side, I'm not going to go through that. Is what I call the prevailing status quo, the lagging. Where, for example, there's this focus on accidents. Say, you know, we last year we had ten fatalities. So this year, if we we have two fatalities, we've done very well. Is that ethically right? Really? That's what we have. That's what I've seen. I've seen in organizations whereby they even have this big sign that says uh, zero harm. Then they have big sign. Then next week they got this. Statistics. Then I look at them and say, okay, tell me. I'm getting confused. Zero harm, and then you got this thing that you've budgeted. The blame culture. Workers are always blamed for accidents. I've seen that in most cases. Is, is there a proper system of actually investigating to make sure that what were the root causes? Focus on numbers, game. You know, I, I love, you know, when I got in industry, people are like, in talking about injury frequency, it's like, fine but they at times used incorrectly. If we're talking about zero harm, really, how do we then apply injured frequency rates? It's just indicators for actions. We should use them like that. Focus on the reactive aspect of incident accident frequency rates. That's what I was, I was telling you, it's reactive. Because we react, we want to look good. And I said to people, how can you look good when you, you benchmark yourself on a wrong parameter? How can you do that? You've killed people, you've injured people, then you say you, you do better on what you've done. I uh, know one injury is too many, one fatality is too many. That's all I can say. So what do we what do we have? There's stagnant performance. There's no improvement whatsoever. There's a regressive quality approach. There is management systems are actually disaster. That's why I put it there in red. So the question is, how do we move from that side? From that side, how do we go to, through this journey to do things right? Uh, sliding. When on the right hand side was sliding, it was disaster. On the left hand side, we're doing things properly. We're managing operational safety properly. What should we do? Where should Africa be? Focus on the leading indicators, prevent non compliances, prevent non conformances. We actually have our risk management system approach, a structured organizational framework, entrenched social dialogue. In other words, employees are empowered, they're knowledgeable. Transformed to the ESG trust after COVID. The ESG trust was conceptualized. Why did it come in? Because it, now we needed to come up with something that looks at a number of things. In other words, an approach which integrates your environment, social, is good, operations, and then governance, how we do things. Why did it come up? That's why it's becoming, it's gaining such momentum nowadays. Continual improvement trust is also very important. Then our sick, we need to tra transform or go through a transition process from where we are to the fourth industrial revolution concept. What are they? So that's really what that slide that I thought I'd just share with you. So let's talk about cost of accidents. I put in there, uh, sorry. I put in there a formula. Let's just talk cost of accidents. It's the only thing that I talked about earlier on. The P, the P is for people. The T is for technology. The E is for environment. The O, P is operational processes. Okay. Time C is consequences. So I've multiplied that. When I multiply that, say so that that's what it is. It's because I'm saying the ratio is not proportionate. When the impact occurs, it's not that there are synergistic effect where the impact is so worse and so serious that you no, know, we can't. We, we do, right now, I don't think we've got adequate systems for evaluating that. Yes. We can look at the, the, the reactive, you know, element like you know, compensation. Fine, employers pay for that. You know, it's, 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 an, it's an insurance approach. But when you look at it, when we now say account the investment, does the employer, does business look at this to say how do we have a holistic approach to this? So what are these? These costs: people, technology, environment, operational processes and communities and community environment. Colleagues, the reason why the last uh, element has been included is because right now, I've been advocating for this. I don't know, maybe 
we need to, to redefine the scope of the, the impact of occupational safety and health because the communities are affected by what happens in the workplace, the emissions and so forth and so forth. Okay. Therefore, on people, there are tangible costs, there are intangible costs. Now, the tangible costs, you know what I'm talking about. Intangible is what we can measure, the impact on the, 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 the mental the trauma that they have. There's also the perceived these are the non-perceived trauma as well. That is very difficult to assess. Also, in terms of the ILO CIS annual data, right now we are sitting on over 2.3 million deaths per annum, which works out to be roughly about 6,000 people per day. Today, there will be over 6,000 people dying in the workplaces. Ethical, is that ethically right? Also, over 650,000 people dying from occupational health diseases or illnesses. Over 340 million occupational accidents reported. Over 160 million people with work-related illnesses. And then an estimated 4% of the national GDP. That's what he says. The question, how does it translate? How do we translate that to enterprise level? I wanted, you know, this was Zimbabwe. I wanted to recruit about 400 additional stuff for the OSH department. I had to go on to, to, the, to the cabinet and present my case. What I did was I was smart. I went and compiled all the data to say, this is the impact of not managing occupational safety and health, of not having enough resources. And guess what? They gave me what I wanted. Because I proved them. I said, it's costing the country so much. I said, we could invest this money for employment creation. We could invest this money to improve the lives of people. So the tangible cause here is adverse impact on the, on the environment, impact on the communities and the environment. Let me give you examples. In Africa, in Zimbabwe, the, in 1972, no, before I go to Zimbabwe, let me go to Zambia. In Zambia, on the 16th of, 16th, no, sorry, on the 25th of September, 1970, there was, Eight, eight, 89 lives were lost when the slimes dam failed because of excessive water. 89 workers died. Okay. That was 1970. 1972 in Zimbabwe, 427 employees died instantly when there was a, an explosion on the cloud of methane. Okay. You may go on to the third one. In South Africa, 16th of September, 1986, 177 workers died in a mine again when acetylene ignited the whole country system and whatever. So people were overcome and they died. Let's go further. Globally, Popal. Popal in India, 5,000 people, employees died directly, and 30,000 community people were affected from chemical. Uh, injuries. Minimata Bay in Japan, even today as we speak, when uh, mercury was uh, discharged and the fish chowed the mercury and people chowed the fish, even today people are suffering deformities, congenital de deformities. Recently, the Ohio train disaster, you see what's happening there. There's the reason why I'm giving you those two because the, the approach is quite different to those in terms of the compensation approach that has been worked out in the US. Let me go back to Bhopal. Bhopal affected so many people here in Africa. But if you look at what happened in, in, in the US, when there was exactly the same accident, same accident, no one, not even one person suffered chemical injury or even died. Take a note, the difference. Then Gulf of Mexico, all, all disaster. I remember that BP, shell, BP incident. Where they were, they, they were made to pay 20 billion. When you look at Africa with all these disasters, how much have companies paid? I leave that to continue for conjecture. Let's talk about the, the challenges for data. It starts from a national system. How do what system do we have to collect this data? And mention how to collect it, how do we collect it? Do they capture the actual cost of business? Because most of the data that I have from different countries, there's mixed masala. 
I think that's a challenge for us also as Osh Africa to see what can we do? What formula can we do to look at? And also the issue of immature occupational safety and health management systems. We do have them. Some cases they are there. I don't want to talk about commitment. There is commitment, there's apparent commitment, there's effective commitment. The two are different. <laughs> apparent is when everybody knows that, you know, oh, okay, you know the story about the, you know, bacon and egg and whatever, where the argument between the pig and then and, and the chicken. The pig says, you know, in this breakfast, I lose my life. You, the, the chicken, you just donate an egg. Yeah, you talk about commitment. The pig is committed. The, the, the chicken is, is devoted. So that's where you can get that. You know. The, the deliberate distortion of underreporting. This is actually quite what you find. By as much as or between 20 to 30 percent of underreporting, we have that. There is also the need for professional diagnosis of occupational health illnesses and diseases. That is one of the problems that we have. I did some research in one company, various companies, and when I looked at how they collected the data, it was quite fascinating because they first, you know, collecting, you know, back injury, you know. Uh, musculos, MSDs, musculoskeletal disorders. They, you know, classify them in a very fine way. Then I said, how do you know? Is what he says, no, you see what you gave them. And then what was even given uh, <laughs> to relieve the pain was something else. I'm not gonna talk about that, you know? Okay, also, what else? Inadequate systems for reporting, recording, investigation and investigating the vaccines. We don't have those. We are not reporting this adequately. There's also, we don't have well-established formal economic plans as well as, I'm sorry, there's a difference between formal economic plans versus SMMEs or the informal sector. We don't capture much of what's happening with SMMEs. I can tell you this much. There is inadequate. I think that is a well-known. Africa, the economies of Africa, they're fast moving towards SMME uh, profile. We need to look at that. It's a new challenge that we have. Also, there's always the reactive versus proactive data systems, leading and lagging indicators. In other words, where we focus on injuries, it has happened. Instead of saying, how do we focus on preventing, which is the leading? So, where are these, where do we get this data that we use to assess? It comes from investigations. And this is what I thought I'll share with you. If you look at what's happening right now, if we were to say, real business understand what needs to be done. It is the first four blocks from the measure of control of your, your, your pre-contact, other words, the pre-contact stage, your risk, your risk management, your management systems, investigations, your root causes, factors, in other words, human factors, workplace factors, the immediate causes. And if we can deal with that through the, the, the business investment into that, then it will prevent the last two blocks. That's a fact. And if we do it properly, that's a fact. I will represent it there again, where I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate my point again to say, this is what is lacking. The management systems approach that Larona you're talking about. If we have a management system, a system approach, it is very clear. There is talking to that, you know, the first one, the inadequate strategy. Second one, inadequate control. The third is the root causes. The fourth, immediate causes. That's what is important. So we need to understand what would impact on the business and how do we you know, you to treat that? There is that formula, you all know about that formula. That formula that was designed by the Loss Control Institute is a guide. But you might find that you know, things have changed right now. Yes, it is a very good, it gives us a layout, but below one day, there's a lot that's happening that we need to look at and reformulate. That's the work that we need to have. Same thing there, there it is. And that is what is critical. And one of saying there, below the, the five to 50, we don't include things like the impact on people, mental health issues, conditions that arise. So the people cost, what are they? The usual, that I'm not gonna go into them in detail. You know them. Larana, I'm glad you did the work for me. Again, the people cost include the treatment, cost of physician, healthcare, and all that. That's also what, what, what you have. That's misery. At this stage, people are suffering. And also what we have in Africa, there's also the issue of accessibility to those services. How do we, how easy is it for us to access those services? Take the issue of farm workers. I mean, for, in terms of farm worker settings, do we have those services that you think are, you believe are adequate? 
while I've got you about farm workers, I share something with you. We were in Geneva in 2000, and we were coming up with the standard on safety and health in agriculture. Then, you know, I asked the delegates, all conference, I said to them, okay, because we argue about, you know, simple thing, providing farm workers with toilets. And then these guys, you know, business were saying, no, 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 they don't, they're very expensive providing the people. They're very expensive. Why should we provide them with toilets? I said, okay. Do you eat salad? They said, yeah, we do eat salad. I said, okay. I said, oh, so where do you get the salad? Ingredients of salad. I said, get them from farms. I said, oh, okay. You know what happens in the farms? The workers, they've got a place for the managers. So when you want your salad, they go and get it there. I said, do you know what happens there? That's where they do all whatever. If you don't provide them with toilets, they go somewhere. I leave that for you, conjecture. The indirect costs on people, by the way, there they are. That's something that we don't measure. Schedule delays, the lower, more lowered morale, a morale of people, increased absenteeism, poor customer relations, retraining and retraining programs. That's already been covered. On the technology, lots of the plants, lots of tools, lots sorry, of equipment. Matthew, lots of, sorry, Matthew. Yeah. Start in the yeah. up right now, okay? Thank you. All right, I'll move very fast. So they, those are the things that we talk about on the environment. The tangible, I'm not going to talk that they're they are very clear. I'll make the presentation available to all of you. These are some of the effects that I wanted to highlight to you in terms of the impact that you know we don't really measure uh, that effectively. The, that, that really basically focus on the environment. The loss of income, also I talked about that. So right, that to, communities, there is the issue of communities. That's something that we need, we need, to, we need to look at as well. I've summarized those again together. Let me go. Right. They, this is what I was talking about. That we need to be able to understand why do these elements input into the overall occupational health and management system. Social dialogue, empowering employees is very important as well. That's what it achieves. Uh, moving fast. That I'm not going to talk about that because I've already alluded that. I've covered that. The benefits, there they are. Benefits, we need to improve production processes, better morale, favorable image and reputation, improve recruiting and retention. Okay. That's what we need to look at in terms of going forward. We need to create that. So we also need to look at <clears throat> entrenching. This has been covered by Laron as well. So the issue of standards, the laws, and the various international standards, they're coming. Tutula talked about that. Where are we looking at that? And what you should be looking at is that to say, the legal applications, how do they talk to what we, the new uh, dispensation as well? And basically, I've highlighted the, the functional uh, benefits of these areas as there. This is one thing that's important. We talked about culture. How do we migrate from where we are to where we look at really proper understanding of the requirement and the impact of not doing business properly in terms of operational safety? You got what we call pathological levels where people don't care, basically. Say, as long as we're not caught, it's okay, right? The next one is reactive. Safety is important. We do a lot every time with an accident. He and all his colleagues, they make a noise, we satisfy them. Then there is calculative. We have systems in place to manage hazards, but they're not effective. They're there by just talking. There's also the proactive part. We work on problems that we still find. That is now where we should be. And then the generative health and safety are how we do business here. That's really the total uh, span of what we should look at. In terms of those areas, again, I've summarized them there. See, we need to go through that ladder and how do we achieve that? That's very important. Right. Education for Africa. Guys, we, there's no way. We need to transition from traditional approach to industrial revolution for the industrial revolution. We need to also move away from a reactive culture to a resilient culture. We need to entrench social dialogue. Why? It will achieve consensus, ownership, commitment, cooperation, and collaboration. And also, we need to transform where we integrate that is she, she occupation self into enterprise operational priorities, align everything of what we do in terms of the impact, the agenda of occupation self and health, and also look at Occupational safety is an essential element of any business conduct. Align the trust to national economic uh, development. In other words, the, the cost 
is actually impacting on the na whole national economy. And also, look at the approach. Risk management is, is very essential. She laws are very critical. Maybe you can give us guide. How we, we apply them? Integrated management wow. is another which we take into account what we've done. I'm almost done. Sir. Then ESG comes in, then fourth industrial revolution part of it. These are elements that we need to focus on. So I'm not going to go through them because they're very clear. Okay, um, Matthew. Yes. Thank you so much. Maybe, we, maybe we, Okay. The last one. Yeah. So the last one, when you talk of risk management profile, this particular format here has got everything. It's a very, very good example, which talks in all the costs, whether environment, whatever, it's all in there. So have a look at it, please pay attention to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. President. Matthew, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I can see, I can see where research work. Can you hear you now? Loaded with information. As a matter of fact, thank you so much. We really appreciate I have been told there are so many questions um, in the in the chat box, but before we see that, it's also very important that we do a summary of the two sessions. Uh, I bring forward Lerona again, and Lerona talk about leadership commitments, relationship between leaders and workers, and how the challenge is shaped workplace health and safety. Is a problem, Chairman. We can hear you, sir. I think you, you I don't know, there's a problem with your audio. We can't hear you, sir. Yeah, there's a problem with the audio. Hey, I don't know what you can do. No, we can't. It's, it's distorted. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I will think so I recall all that the road has said. Also mentioned that um not of both uh of both human and capital resources. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Hear you, Mr. Nube. We can hear you. Please go ahead. I think what we can do while Mr. A.E. Is, is the president is trying to get in is, let's get questions, I think, from the people, for Larona and myself, so that you know, we proceed. We don't allow the to be stagnant. When he comes in, we will come in. At least we're making progress. Can we get questions and comments from people, <clears throat> from participants, please?
We'll start with you, Larona. <laughs> Do you have any questions or comments? Okay, Mr. Mulbe, there's a question on the chat. Mr. Matthew? Yes, I can see the question on the chat. <clears throat> it says that in regard to cost of safety, not accidents, Changing a process of machine for safety reasons may it bring some profits, e.g., improve productivity, morale of people, relations. Where this figure uh, comes to your calculations, it's, it's very important. It's actually a very valid question and comment as well. Because I'll give you a very practical example. I don't want to be theoretical. I work for one of the organizations, quite a number of them, where uh, because of, let me talk about the way that I was used. Planned preventive maintenance was not in place, was not uh, implemented properly and correctly. And you know what, what actually is involved in that is that, you know, for an organization to implement plan, planned preventive maintenance, you must have an inventory of what you call your critical equipment, right, and operations. They did not even have that. But so in this case, I was involved, I was working in that, in that particular big plant. We're manufacturing a product, which I'm not going to mention, because I know you're going to say to me, you, you know, precious everything there than this product. So let, let's, let's leave it for another day. So what happens is that you know, the, our productivity went down to something below 40%. 40, 40 Obviously, the company was concerned. We're not making money. If anything, there was no... Uh, we're losing the, the, the process and the product at the same time. So what, what happened? We did not even talk to the employees. The line guys didn't talk to the employees. We went and bought them a machine which cost millions. And we installed it. And the problem didn't go away. And the employees left their cuts out. But because of the nature of the work that I do, you know, I talk to employees. And the employee said to me, why didn't you talk to us? And I said, but didn't your guys talk to you? Your line supervisors said, no, no one talked to us. We know what the problem is, Matthew. And they told me what the problem was. You know? And I went to the guys, the guys, the guys are talking about the, we, did, we are not maintaining things. There's a value. So there's maintenance part of it. There's also the replacement part of it. So all those costs need to be looked at. Dr. Mr. He is back. So Mr. He, we thought we would just continue. <laughs> we didn't want to. <laughs> Yeah, we still we still are having problems. Same problems that we had before. We still have them with, with your communication. So I don't know what we can do there. Try again, sir. I don't know what to do. Okay, we'll pop up on the post. Did you do those questions? We can't hear you. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I, I sorry I was responding to that. So, so two things here apply. There is the also the element whereby I say to you, the replacement is going to be in line with your planned preventive maintenance program. Because there's a cycle of some of the equipment that we need to have. In terms of that cycle, say, look, it's used, it's sell by date, it's expired, so it must be replaced. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I think there's a message. Please write your questions on the chat, then we can respond to them. Can you hear me now, Matthew? 
Yes, better say. Yes, much better. Thank you. You can take over, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I think the questions are all coming to you now, Matthew. Please take on them, I beg. I think some questions have been forwarded to you directly. Check your chat, chat boss. Okay. I think you have, you have taken some. Is Leruna still here? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Um, now we have a few minutes uh, to end, uh, end this session. Uh, would you want to give your your party your your party results or party notes rather? Okay. Um, I'm not sure I got the last part of your question, but what I want to say is that uh, from what Mr. Ngube has just said, we can see the importance of you know interacting with employees. He was able to solve the problem through interaction and asking employees questions, asking them about you know, um, their experiences. So it's very important that you know, as management, in order to solve some of the problems that we have within the workplace, safety problems, you know, interaction with those people who are you know, um, working on the floor with the hazardous substances is very important. Okay, so um, in closing, I just want to say that um, I encourage uh, us, I encourage management to play their part in ensuring health and safety in the workplace. Let's see management being actively involved in safety initiatives. Okay, where there is need for training, let's see management going for training, not just management, even employees. Let's see people going for, you know, training such that at the end of the day, they are able to implement what they have learned through trainings in creating safer working environments. Thank you, Mr. Ngube. Thank you, so much, uh, Mr. Mato, you want to give your, your final words? Sir, you're not very clear. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sorry, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah. I was saying my last remarks. Yeah. My last remarks are just simple this. Currently, we are not quantifying the cost of the failures of OSH management systems uh, to business. We're not doing that. We need to look at, as uh, uh, one of the agent metrics, we need to look at finding out a system of how we, this data can be collected because this data is very important because it can motivate you know, industry to invest in occupational safety. When they look at that, because the investment proportionate is far, far less than the losses. That, that's the fact of that. That's one. Then the second thing is, I think we, as professionals, I think we need to look at adopting strategies whereby as we provide data and information to get things done, that data is got to talk and motivate for things to be done through tangible actions. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. that on uh, 
um, president. Maybe you can write it because I think the distortion is back again. Maybe you can help us by uh, okay. writing your. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.